Welcome to the HCI family of podcasts, where your source for personal, professional, and organizational growth and development. We share our own original research, explore industry trends, and interview executives and thought leaders from across the globe. Join us for practitioner-oriented content around all things leadership, HR, talent management, organizational development, and change management. Maximize your personal and organizational potential with the HCI family of podcasts. Welcome to the podcast. In this podcast episode, I talk with Carrie Sparrow about upgrading your market intelligence in order to compete for talent. Carrie Sparrow, welcome to the conversation today. John, it's great to be here. Thanks for having me on. It is a pleasure to be with you. You're joining us from Minneapolis. I'm south of Salt Lake City in Utah. And today we're going to be talking about upgrading your market intelligence in order to compete for talent. We all know that it's a tight labor market, especially in particularly high-skilled areas, anything STEM, anything healthcare, uh, lots of other areas that it's just really hard to get good people. We have skills gaps everywhere. And frankly, I don't know how it is in Minneapolis, but generally speaking across the U.S., the unemployment rate's fairly low in Utah. I think we have like an unemployment rate of like 2.3%, which means there's basically nobody looking for jobs. So yep. to be able to recruit good talent is a real challenge. And there's lots of positions open um, that that organizations are really struggling to fill. Uh, so we're going to talk about how we can address that. As we get started, I wanted to share Carrie's bio with everybody. Carrie Sparrow is the founder and CEO of Wagescape, where they provide developers, analysts, and consulting firms with access to the world's largest, most up-to-date labor market data collection. This makes the labor market more transparent, opening the doors to tremendous efficiencies and world-changing innovation. Now, there's a whole lot more that I could say about Wagescape, but I'll leave that to you. Anything else you would particularly like to highlight by way of your background, context, or your company before we dive on in? No, I mean, my own background is a little bit of kind of a purple squirrel. I, uh, you know, started in computer engineering and then was in the military. I was a submarine officer for eight years. Then I got into consulting, grew into a consulting leadership role where I helped lots of companies face lots of challenges, primarily around um, talent and HR, and then was a corporate HR and IT executive uh, in a big global company for a while before I founded Wagescape and all those experiences gave me the insights to say, hey, I think there's a much better way uh, to see what's actually happening with things that touch all of our lives every day, jobs, pay, skills, um, yeah. you know, who's hiring and what are they hiring for? And so that's what we built Wagescape to do. Yeah. Well, very cool. Uh, and you spoke a little bit to just kind of the origin story, but maybe you could zoom in a little bit more. What served as that inspiration for Wagescape? Um, tell us a little bit more about that background and history and how you started to develop it. Sure. I, I had the benefit of uh, working with lots of, diff I mean, a couple hundred companies uh, that were facing challenges that largely related to how they manage their workforce and saw a real evolution over about 20 years where initially there was a heavy emphasis on standardizing processes and then moving mm -hmm. those processes to technology and then moving that technology to the cloud and restructuring, you know, HR functions and IT functions and every, everything else. Um, and they all, all those efforts fell short. And when I was actually in the job, you know, where I was responsible for upgrading kind of the, the workforce management capabilities of, you know, an organization that had 150,000 people across almost 70 countries. Mm -hmm. But what I came to realize is that for most larger companies, um, and for the economy overall, that it's really the, the biggest bottleneck is data. The biggest bottleneck to effectively managing your workforce is data because uh, data is really hard to get. Um, it's not, when you can get it, it's not in a form that's particularly useful. And so you need people with, you know, lots of PhDs and you know, statisticians, uh, labor economists, compensation specialists to really kind of understand or try to understand what's happening in the market. And so I saw this firsthand and at the same time was realizing that, well, a lot more information is now more immediately available. 
And if you can find a way to consolidate information from one organization to another using the same language. So a lawyer in one company means something totally different than a lawyer on the other side of the world. Um, or, you know, a software programmer could be called something totally different in another company, uh, like a software engineer or something. If you can find a way to kind of work out those differences, uh, then there would be a lot easier way to collect all the information in real time about what's what's uh, what's really going on. And in an economy, you know, especially an economy that you know is close to a hundred trillion dollars worldwide in salaries and benefits every year, uh, if you've got really bad information, that means you have huge inefficiencies. And so I saw really came to saw what was happening with the state of technology and data kind of online, especially uh, with being kind of a disruptive approach to understanding what's happening in a very, very inefficient labor market. And this was all before the pandemic. This was back in you know, 2014, 2015, when we started touring around with this idea. I founded the company in 2015 um, and put together a, uh, a technology capability and a data platform that draws from uh, online sources, uh, lots of uh, online you know, job listing sources and uh, publicly available career profile sources to see what's actually in the, in the market for you know, people and jobs, um, what are people getting paid, and initially uh, was able to get some good traction with some, some great organizations, universities, consulting firms, big corporations, names that you'd recognize if you go out to our website, you'll, you'll see some of them. Um, and uh, then, then the pandemic hit and the whole labor market just went completely sideways. Um, mm -hmm. and that was really a big kind of, um, shot in the arm for us because the kinds of intelligence that we were dealing with was exactly the kinds of things that people needed to have, but they didn't have any other sources to go to, you know, so some of the factors that went into that, um, uh, first of all, you had a very, very disparate impacts of the pandemic itself. You had yeah. uh, some parts of, uh, you know, some industries where everything shut down, like all hiring stopped. Um, folks went home. Businesses went out of business. Uh, it was horrible. We all we all lived through that. There were other parts of the economy, though, where it was exactly the opposite demand business demand just flooded into things like um, supply chain and logistics and um, home delivery. And I mean, the whole, the whole notion of supply chains was, was upended. And so you had some places where they weren't doing anything and others where they couldn't get workers fast enough. And as a result, you started to see workers or employers finally uh, capitulating and um, uh, raising wages very, very dramatically. The, kinds of things that you know we track we're able to see on a daily basis what's happening with hiring and pay so we knew what was going on but we also were hearing everything that the traditional sources of market you know mm -hmm. like economic data and so forth were saying and there was a big huge disconnect between what we were seeing was actually going on and and what folks were saying because they didn't have really any good information it was all speculation so you have you have very disparate impacts in terms of, you know, unemployment and hiring needs. You've got wages that are going up. Then you have remote work that, you know, very quickly uh, companies started realizing and, and workers started realizing they could do their jobs from anywhere. And so companies recognized they could hire from anywhere. And so yeah. now a lot of the assumptions in terms of how, you know, how you needed to see kind of the job market went out the window because the job market, instead of being right around your, you know, wherever you were located was now, nationwide and in a lot of cases global. Um, so, so that was a real shot in the arm for us because what we had done in the meantime was we had created the world's largest platform for real-time pay and hiring intelligence. And what that means is that as an example in the US, we track data from about 60 countries, but in the US we track over 80% of all new jobs um, that are mm -hmm. created in the country, right? So this is you know, sample sizes that are measured in millions, whereas economic, you know, survey data and so forth usually are dealing with thousands of data points. And so they're not really that accurate or precise, whereas ours was really precise. We could see almost every job in the country. Um, we could see who was doing the hiring, how much the, the organizations were expecting to pay, what they needed. So we could see how skills were changing um, and evolving. 
And we do that every day. We, uh, we go and we scan the, the entire market every day. Uh, so it's very real. You know, it is as real time as, as you'd want or need at this stage. Um, and so our problem at that point was not that we didn't have a solution and that we didn't have mm-hmm. a market condition that needed the solution. Our problem was that uh, nobody knew about us because when I first set up the company, I wanted to just sell to other people who would incorporate our data into technology solutions or consulting solutions or research that didn't need applications. Because when you get in the application business, you tend to you know, focus just on those specific applications. But there's tons of folks that, you know, people in financial services and fintech and big corporations, HR consultancies, uh, recruiting firms, uh, hedge funds and investment managers, uh, banks, and you know, folks that look at like bond portfolios and real estate prices. All of these, all of these different groups and more, um, media companies, uh, sales intelligence folks, uh, all of them and more need uh, labor market data. And so, if we had been in the business of creating applications, you know, for all those different uses, we never would have gotten anywhere. So, I wanted to be strictly just a a data provider to to relatively big companies. But when the, you know, 2020, late 2020, early 2021, when everything was completely out of bounds with historical expectations, we realized that we needed to get, uh, we needed to get our intelligence in the hands of many, many more users, more users than our, our current clients could, could reach. And so that's, that's when we, we started building applications and other services that were, you know, direct to end user. Um, and we've really seen demand, you know, come up, come up from that standpoint, but it's a totally different game. Now, uh, if you're a hiring manager, you know, this, that you're, you're dealing with very, very different factors, um, than you were three years ago. And those factors vary by job. They vary by industry. They vary by location to give you an idea. Um, uh, in between 2021 and, uh, the first half of 2023 advertised wages we're going up at over 20% a year across all jobs in the U S right. So when we average kind of for all different types of jobs, all different locations, how much was, you know, year over year, uh, advertised wages going up is 20%. And it's still going up at that rate, which through my entire life, wage inflation has been between two and 4%. So this is, you know, dramatically different. But the thing is, is that those, those, those wage impacts vary depending on where you are. So, you know, in 2022, for example, um, while wages in general were going up 20%, if you were in certain parts of Indiana, they were going up 80%. And if you were in certain parts around the Bay Area of all places in California, they actually dropped about 5%. And so um, it's really variable now. And so it's a totally yeah. different economic environment. And in order to effectively find talent and keep the talent that you've got, um, you need a, a completely different source of insights, uh, much more real time, much more, yeah. granular, much more localized. So, yeah. well, I appreciate that just at the very end, as you said, uh, real time granulized and localized. So yeah. very important. Uh, so I think I'm sure anyone listening is thinking, yeah, of course, the better data we have, the more, you know, the better kind of decisions we can make in terms of staffing and Mm -hmm. recruitment strategies and trying to compete for talent. Um, And and having that data is going to be super powerful. And and frankly, it's going to put you ahead of a lot of organizations that don't have that. And it's not informing their strategies and their decisions. Um, Can you talk through, you know, some specific, maybe some specific examples of how this has helped organizations, uh, specifically those and particularly those who ha- are find themselves in those those industries and fields where it's just really really challenging. How have these these market insights and intelligence helped them to find the right people and to be in a better place in terms of their talent strategy? Sure, we see it across the board. So um, the uh, you know where it's where it's really pronounced. So it's it's absolutely an issue for anyone trying to hire or keep talent of any, any stripe, but where it's really pronounced is when your business depends on uh, hourly workers that will literally um, just go down the street to a, to a new job that's paying 50 cents an hour more. 
And there's a lot of that that's been happening and things are changing so fast. So, so we're seeing that companies that have a big hourly workforce have completely changed the way that they manage their pay. They, um, our clients uh, are monitoring pay constantly in the areas and for the jobs that they care about. Because all of our data comes from the public domain to start with, um, we don't have to hide who the who the hiring organizations are or who the companies are that um, we're tracking data from because it's all out there to start with. They've already shared what we what we provide. We just do it on a massive scale and and allow you to really analyze it. And so they're watching, you know, they're not just watching the jobs in their in their individual markets. Sometimes they get down to, you know, if they're in a bigger city, they get down to different sections of the city then and watch what's happening to pay. They also are recognizing that who they're competing with is not who they thought they were competing with. Mm -hmm. For example, there was a client of ours who um, was uh, did recruiting services for a machine shop in the Midwest, uh, mid-sized machining operation. And the traditional starting pay very, very quickly uh, did not keep pace with the market so that their their starting workers, which were skilled tradespeople, these were machinists uh, and fabricators, welders, spot welders, their starting pay was about the same as uh, high demand shifts in a number of fast food uh, restaurants because very quickly that pay, you know, broke, you know, started at like 10 an hour and, and broke through 15, then is now up to close to 20 an hour in certain markets. Mm -hmm. Okay. So big changes there. Uh, and these folks had no idea that that was going on. And so, you know, who you're competing with is totally different now than who you, you know, who you thought, uh, in the past. Um, and so, uh, I do a lot of work with my, uh, my son's school and it's the same thing with teachers where, uh, mm -hmm. Teachers are leaving the profession uh, yep. because of, yes, there's there's considerations around like the teaching environment and, and support teachers get, but really pay is a huge issue for them. And now schools are not competing with other schools for teachers. They're competing with all other careers for teachers because the pay has fallen behind so much there. So our clients have really adapted how they look at how they look at how they need to be managing pay and hiring decisions and also how they need to be thinking about retaining their, their own employees because every one of their employees is a target for somebody else. And, you know, if you're, if you're offering kind of a 5% raise to somebody, but they love where they work, um, then, you know, you're, you're probably not going to, not going to get them, but, if somebody loves where they work and they get offered a 30% raise or a 40% raise, it's a totally different ball game. Um, and so now people realize that they've got to stay on top of, on top of that, especially where they have big pay sensitive employees. There's another piece, which is just competitive insights. Um, mm -hmm. folks have, uh, this was kind of, this is surprising to all of our clients when they start working with us is they, you know, they start wanting to know what's happening in kind of their local markets and what's happening with hiring and pay and skills for the jobs they care about. But what they very quickly realize is now they've got insights into all their competitors. They can see who they're hiring. They can see who's who's ramping up, you know, in, in anticipation of growth or opportunities, who's cutting back. Um, so you get a level of competitive intelligence that's never been available before, uh, at least not easily, not easily available, not without paying a lot of money to different consulting firms. So, you know, it's, it's still playing out. This is a relatively new capability. There's only a small handful of, uh, of providers in the space, but we're seeing uh, adoption that is just skyrocketing uh, as more and more companies are embracing, you know, the need for a different approach to market intelligence. Yeah. And, and perhaps you've already addressed it, but are there kind of emerging new market intelligence capabilities even today than what we saw six months ago, a year ago, certainly five years ago, where do you see things going say in the next year or two? So we have kind of as a core confidence, the ability to collect very, very efficiently on a very large scale information from lots of different places. And so we get at when you, when you do that, uh, when you're able to do that now, suddenly you're able to provide insights that weren't available before. So we're seeing um, 
lots of lots of folks are coming to us saying, in addition to what you already provide, can you get data from different sources? So merge, for example, online hiring data with government, you know, government census, government unemployment data, uh, and so forth, or merge, you know, data from our platform and a sales intelligence platform, uh, merge, uh, merge data from um, uh, a, a whole bunch of, you know, different things. We had one come up the other day that was wanting in one country uh, that has strong union representation, wanting to uh, create a much more um, functional source of information about um, union bargaining agreements. Uh, and all of our core capabilities can can do that. Uh, so, um, yeah, that's where, you know, as part of our mission, uh, we recognize that with better quality information comes lots of opportunity for uh, innovation, not just efficiency. And we're seeing that every day. We, uh, we get people coming to us with, with more ideas and, and wanting to get um, more things where they've got a real commercial case for it. Um, mm -hmm. So I would expect that... Uh, the whole nature of market intelligence is going through an evolution right now that'll last for a few years and where we come out on the other side of it will be completely different than where we started. Yeah, super interesting. Well, Carrie, this has just been a really fun conversation. I know we've only scratched the surface. There's whole, so much more we could go into depth on. I also know at the time I need to let you go here in just a minute before we wrap things up for today. I just wanted to give you a chance to share with the audience how they can connect with you, find out more about your work, your team, and then give us a final word on the topic for today. Yeah, so I would love anyone who's interested in what we're talking about, who has questions about it, you can reach me on LinkedIn. You can reach me at uh, carry at wagescape.com. You can go out to our website uh, as well. So we would love to talk with you. Um, we're super excited uh, about the possibilities in front of us. And uh, we've got, uh, we're lucky that we've got a lot of forward thinking and, and great brand um, clients that, uh, that are helping to really kind of stretch the new frontier. Uh, and I would say, you know, if this isn't something that you're thinking about right now, stand by because you're going to start to see a lot more of it. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Carrie. It's been a real pleasure. I encourage the audience to reach out, get connected, find out more about what Carrie and his team can do for you. And as always, I hope everyone can stay healthy and safe. How you can find meaning and purpose at work each and every day. And I hope you all have a great week. Thanks for joining us for this episode of the podcast. We hope you stay healthy and safe and please join us again soon.